Hello and welcome everyone to our virtual author event with Richard Roper, who is joining us from London, England this afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us. Before I begin, I wanna go over some general housekeeping. We are so excited to have, have everyone on today and ask that you please mute your mics and turn your camera off so that we can spotlight our author and staff. We encourage everyone to please write their questions to the author in the chat and we'll be getting to them later. My name is Okaria Domango. I'm the Adult Program Coordinator at the Oceanside Library, and I encourage you all to check out our online calendar as we have so many great virtual programs coming up this spring. I would also like to introduce the moderators for this afternoon. We have our Head of Adult Services, Nadine Spano, and our Adult Services Librarian, Brianna Moore. Um, I would also like to thank our director, Chris Mara, and assistant director, Tony Ivino, as well as our board of directors for giving us the opportunity to offer events like this one to our community. We could not have done it without their support. And now I will hand it over to my colleague, Brianna Moore, to kick off our event. Cool. Thanks, Okaria. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Today's guest is author Richard Roper. Richard Roper grew up in Stratford-upon-Avon before studying English at the University of Sheffield. He now lives in London where he works as an editor. Today, we're gonna to be talking about his book, um, Something to Live For, which was previously published as How to Not Die Alone. This title has been translated into 19 languages. And if you wanna know more about him, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at his handle, Richard Roper, or he can be found on his website, richardroperauthor.com. Richard, thank you so much for being here with us. Nadine and I and I'm, the gang of o Oceanside are just, you know, happy to have you here. Nadine, I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Brianna. Thanks, Richard. So, Richard, I reached out to you um, after our staff, um, at, I guess it was in 2019, passed around um, your book. We have the original title, How Not to Die Alone. And we will talk a little bit about the title change as we go along. But it became an instant staff favorite. And we were just, we just handed the book off from one to the other to the other, and we just couldn't get enough of it. So um, I am so glad that you're here because we still give this out as it's one of our favorites to give out to folks um, who are looking to read something heartwarming and fun. And I'll tell you a little bit, a little synopsis about the book for those who might not have read it. Um, there might be spoilers here. So if you haven't read it, I, you know, I'm going to give you a heads up. It's still worth reading, even if you know what happens. Um, but it's about a, a young man named Andrew, who is a bit quirky and often awkward, um, but lovable all the same. And um, so many themes in this book about friendship and how things, um, aren't always what they seem. And there's more to, than meets the eye, I guess you would say. Um, Andrew has told a white lie at work. Many of us might be able to <laughs> uh, know how that happens just because it made him feel better. And that white lie sort of becomes an issue for him um, when his boss decides to, uh, wants everyone to host a, a dinner at everyone else's home. So um, Andrew is faced with revealing his true self. Um, we love this book because it really went in a lot of places I didn't think it would go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess I'll start by saying, you know, Richard, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? But I also really wanna know what inspired this story for you. Andrew is such a unique, character, um, unlike anyone else, I think, um, I, I've, I've read before. So tell us a little bit about you, about your writing, and then how you came to Andrew's story. Sure. Well, first off, I should say thank you so much for, for having me. This is so cool. I'm kind of, I've, I've um, not done a, an event for so long, and it's, it's been, uh, yeah, I've, I've obviously just missed uh, showing off and talking about myself and the, and the book, so this is fun <laughs> to get a chance to do this. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, yes, well, I suppose I, uh, I have been working in uh, publishing uh, myself kind of on the other side of the fence, as it were, as an editor for uh, eight or nine years now in London, where I work as a nonfiction editor at Hachette in London. And before that, I don't think I'd ever really seriously thought about writing. It's funny, I've done quite a few of these 
events where I've been on a panel with other authors and they have sort of talked about, you know, writing their first novel when they were six and putting it in, you know, writing it in, and sort of squirreling away and having dreams of being an author and, and sort of constantly it's it sort of being their vocation and something they had to do. And I always feel a little bit guilty because I sort of think I just didn't even really think about it until kind of relatively recently. And I think part of that was because I just didn't, it, the idea of actually sitting down and writing that many words just seemed like the most impossible thing in the world, particularly having, I did, I studied English at university and writing big essays, which in retrospect now were, you know, a piece of cake about probably about a, a day's worth of uh, writing what I do now, just seen it was, I never enjoyed the process. So it was only really when I started working in publishing and I'm lucky enough that I'm a non-fiction editor but I sit uh, next to a lot of fiction editors and some absolutely brilliant ones at that who have edited everyone from uh, Sarah Winman to Maggie O'Farrell to just some of the best fiction writers working in the business at the moment and the more I heard these editors pitching books or talking about their authors or and the more I got to read uh, and delve into fiction, the more I suddenly felt like I wanted to be part of that. And when I started writing, it was, um, I remember the sort of specific moment where I thought, oh, I think I'm really enjoying this was when I must've been about 23, 24, and I had to write an all company email to everyone at work about something incredibly mundane. It was admin related. But I was so bored that I remember really trying really hard to write something that was just quite entertaining and <clears throat> seeing what the most sort of uh, fun and interesting way I could, which in retrospect sounds absolutely mad and I can't believe I wasn't fired after about a week. But the sort of response I got from people just from writing this stupid email was really sort of encouraging and someone sort of said, oh, you should write something properly. And from that moment on, I just started dabbling with a, a couple of, ideas, writing sort of little short stories and, and that sort of thing. And I think I must have been about six or seven years ago now, I started with an idea for a novel, which uh, I, I couldn't even tell you what the beginning of that sort of process was, but I just over about the course of a year kind of got a novel to, together and, and wrote it almost unexpectedly. Like it, it sort of crept up on me that I'd accumulated all these words and it was, it ended up, not, you know, I was, by the end of it, I was kind of really confident about it and feeling really happy that I got that far. And then obviously, inevitably, the moment I started feeling happy and optimistic about it, when it went out on submission, and of course it was rejected. Uh, and so then at that point, obviously I'm in my kind of chastened uh, author mode of, oh, well, my, my, how has my genius not been discovered? I can't believe it, uh, how <laughs> terrible for the world. Um, and obviously in retrospect I'm so glad that that wasn't a book that got picked up because it, it just really wasn't up to scratch but what happened then was that I had read lots of articles about what you're supposed to do when your first book is out on submission and the all the advice I'd heard was just start writing something else because if the first, first book gets rejected then you will feel you're back staring at that blank page again so kind of get moving and start something else and so that's what I did and I had Another idea for something, uh, it was a rom-com from what I can remember, a sort of fairly kind of uh, upbeat story, which I wrote again about 85,000 words of, and I got to the end of it and I just found myself thinking, I don't think this is the one either. I'd just read a couple of books about structuring novels and structuring stories and everything I'd read in this book about what you shouldn't do was everything I had done with that book so at that point I was feeling slightly uh lost with it all but I still I was I decided just to put that novel in a drawer and just forget about it and at that point I was sort of pondering on what to do next and whether I was even going to carry on carry on writing but I'd sort of I was feeling having read these books there's a very good book I'd recommend called Into the Woods by by John York, which is, he's a British screenwriter and he wrote a book that is essentially about the art of stories and why we enjoy stories so much as readers and TV watchers and movie watchers. And 
it was an absolute inspiration because it just made everything so clear to me about what it is that we respond to with stories from you know from soap operas to you you know literary novels however people are playing with the form there are still certain commonalities which mean that you're kind of sticking with whatever the story is so I kind of had that in mind and then one day on my lunch break at work I was just uh, scrolling through some news articles and I came across the story uh, that was I think the, the article was actually titled what happens when someone dies alone and if you're anything like me if you see a story like that you're, you're kind of clicking in a slightly morbid but intrigued way and the article was about uh, local authority workers in Liverpool and the north of England who their day job was to deal with the situation where that unfortunate outcome had happened where someone had passed away without having any friends or family around them and when that happens there's obviously a little bit of a, of a kind of a mystery to be solved to some extent in terms of you know has this person got a next of kin that we can contact or are they just you know they've got to a point where sadly there wasn't anyone else around them uh, and there were other considerations to do with uh, the financial side of things you know it was really kind of mind-blowing but obviously uh, sort of completely expected when you think about it that when something like that happens there are financial implications about if someone's you know uh, got lots of money in, the, in their bank account but they've got no one to leave it to where does it go and all these sorts of things and kind of what really struck me from reading this article and subsequently doing more research into people who do this job in real life was that they all shared a sense of really of kind of profoundly stoic uh, kind they were just so kind of good natured and it seemed that quite a few of, the, of them would attend the funerals of these people if there was no one else around for them to to, to be there which just struck me as such a kind of incredibly uh, powerful thing a sort of small gesture which kind of means so much in so many ways and it was one of those things where the more I thought about it the more I wanted to explore a story that involved someone who was doing that job and then I suppose it, it then progressed from there where I, I found myself thinking well what if the person who is doing that job is actually looking like they might be in a similar position themselves and that just sort of struck me as the kind of as an interesting kind of jumping off point and the story just kind of spanned from there. That's wonderful it really is such who knew that you know you wouldn't think about that type of a job without reading what happens to those um, people and you know, Andrew in particular had so many layers to him. Was he based off of someone you knew yourself? Was there certain characteristics that he had that you saw in people? Because he's written so well. Um, how did Andrew kind of form from that? Oh, well, thanks. That's, that's kind of lovely to hear. I'm glad that that is the case. I think he, um, there are certain, it, it certainly is, there's a lot of myself and Andrew. I'd love to pretend that there wasn't and that, I, that I'm not the slightly awkward British guy that he, uh, that he is. But I think that in terms of the uh, his sort of experiences as a character who deals with loneliness quite a lot, mm -hmm. that was something that, that I was drawing on from, from my own life of someone who'd uh, sort of throughout the time of having moved to London I grew up in a little village in the middle of the countryside and then moving to London I think I had as so many people do when you move to you know the big city you kind of have these expectations of your life going in a, in a certain way and and as, as much as I've been absolutely happy with how things were going there were still you know moments which I think are which I think kind of we all have no matter what your situation is when you're in a city where you're surrounded by so many people, but you can almost feel kind of the loneliest in those moments mm -hmm. where it feels like there's so many kind of missed opportunities in terms of connecting with people. And I think that was definitely kind of, I, I don't think when I set out to write the story that 
um, I was thinking, oh yes, I've been through X, Y, and Z, and I want to kind of put that into this character. I think those sorts of things kind of naturally flowed from that. And I think I probably subconsciously was drawing on quite a lot of my own uh, experiences. I mean, I think the, the story I tell about the, uh, the, you mentioned about Andrew telling this white lie, which is um, the sort of crux of the story rests on the fact that his, Andrew's colleagues think that he has a, uh, a wife and a, and a family waiting for him back home, which is something that kind of came out of a misunderstanding in his, in a job interview. And I, I've obviously not made up that I've got a secret family, but I have, there was a particular moment where I was in our work shared kitchen one morning and uh, I hadn't really done anything. It was a Monday morning and I hadn't really done anything at the weekend. Um, I don't think I'd seen that many people. It was just one of those weekends where it just felt like it kind of went on forever and I hadn't really done much. Uh, and someone just sort of making coffee Monday morning, 8.50, you're not really concentrating. And someone asked me what I'd done at the weekend. And without really thinking, I just said, oh yeah, I just saw some friends, which I hadn't. And then they said, all oh, right, what did you do? And then suddenly I was found myself kind of imagining what we'd done. And I said, oh, we went to a museum. The biggest lie of all, because <laughs> you know, let's face it. And then they sort of, I found myself kind of caught in this mad web of lies where they were asking me like, all oh, right, and what, so who is it? Where, you know, which, what exhibits were you seeing? And by the end of it, I was caught in this thing. Like I, it was like I'd committed some terrible crime and <laughs> an alibi, it was bizarre. And so from a sort of point of view where that, the idea that you would then, when it came to Andrew, that he would sort of almost, you know, he would get caught in this lie, but then he would find himself um, taking com comfort from it to a certain extent because it helped him kind of fit in. And I think that we, I think a lot of people do that particularly when it comes to social media if you look at someone's instagram feed compared to what they you know how their life is actually going we're very good at carefully kind of curating these you know what our life is like uh, for people and i think so that certainly played into it and then in terms of the other things that make andrew up you know i'm a big fan of um films and comedies where there is a slightly awkward central male character who the sort of slightly lovable loser I suppose who the underdog who can't quite seem to connect with people where there's a lot of where I think both you know the the kind of the comedy and the pathos comes from in uh in films and tv shows where there's you know someone who just can't quite connect with people for whatever reason so I've been I was certainly drawing on a lot of those uh those moments as well um, and so, yeah, I think that's what we can all fed into the character of Andrew in the end. Did you have, did you join any model train forums for, because, or is that a hobby? Because Andrew and his model trains. Yes, yeah, so Andrew's big hobby in the novel is that he, uh, he has these model trains up in his attic where he sort of, it's, his, yeah, his, his big hobby and he, the sort of his friends that he's uh, found kind of exist online so they are on a, a model train forum and I which if you've ever joined one of those forums or just looked at them they are fascinating places where it's kind of all of human life is there because you can see the way that people respond to each other and and you kind of I, I find them fascinating just to kind of look at because firstly they feel quite old school in a very charming way where it's not twitter where someone says Oh, I quite like trains. And then immediately someone says, How dare you say that? You are clearly, you know, QAnon or whatever, whatever. And then it all goes mad. But when it's something like a, a forum, it's quite a sort of charming, kind of um, uh, old school kind of place. And you could see these, these uh, I mean, I'm almost certain 99.9% .9 men having, you know, very nerdy chats about kind of their model train collection, but in a way where there was clear, you know, real affection there for their, for their hobby. And I'm really, really, I haven't really got any kind of hobbies like that myself, but I, I can very much see the day where I've got a kind of shed in a garden and I've, I'm spending all my retirement money on <laughs> bankrupting myself <laughs> on something kind of, um, you know, where it's a hobby where you can build on it and build on it and, 
I really, really love when you see, um, if you're on a train and you see a, a bunch of people that are all dressed in the same way because they clearly have to go and do their kind of thing and they're, you know, or in a corner of a pub and they're all kind of playing Warhammer or whatever it is. I just love it because I just think, you know, you found your people and you should absolutely be celebrated for that. Loved, um, I really loved Andrew's group of friends there. That was, um, that was a great group and his honesty online. And I think we all can relate a little bit to coming out of our shells, you know, in that online forum and, and leaning for, on them for camaraderie and, and support and other things like that. Um, and, and there are so many themes in this book, like I mentioned before, I mean, obviously friendship is one. Um, and, you know, not to judge a book by its cover, so to speak, because Andrew, you, you know, you brought up his white lie and his imagined family and life. But for Andrew, there was a twist there and that, you know, there, it was also a, a dream that died, I think, literally for him. And, and so that just hits you. I think we all were like, oh, you know, you just, it takes your breath away when you learn that about him. And as you could see how loving he is. And, and um, so the themes of family and he has his sister, Sally and, and all of that. Were there any themes that came as a surprise to you when you were, when you finished the novel? Anything that, um, you know, was, was unexpected? That's a good question. I'd... I think, I mean, I'd sort of, I'd kind of, um, and I think this is quite a rare thing actually, as I'm, as I found out when I was writing my second book, which was that the idea for, for the book came fairly fully formed in terms of who the main characters were going to be and the, the kind of the, the point where we were going to end up, um, which was something that I'd had learned from uh, reading these books about structure and and that sort of thing is that the idea that if you think of a film you will quite often have the opening image to the film to the film and then the final scene will quite often be sort of mirror images of each other but you see the character in in one place and then by the end they'll be in a completely different place or they'll be back at the start but you know everything's changed and I think that I knew I wanted to get Andrew from a point where <clears throat> he was living this sort of this fantasy life where he had kind of constructed a reality which meant that it was a, something that he could sort of rely on and uh, and kind of act as a comfort for him but ultimately it was going to stop him confronting this past trauma and from kind of um, you know having a second chance at really throwing himself into his life and so by the end of it you sort of see the progression that he's had so there wasn't anything really that in terms of themes that kind of knocked that off track I suppose the thing that that came out of it was there's been there's quite a few books I think that have been written around the same time about loneliness because I think it is a you know a, a massive problem in society and I think the pandemic has really brought that to the to the front of people's minds as well is that you know it's really shown how how kind of how troubling it is um, at the moment and I think the thing that that uh, other sort of books I think that have been written where there's loneliness is featured that there tends to be a quite a um, uh, a lot of store put in the idea of community and people kind of coming together and pitching together which I think is ideally what we want to happen and what would be the best thing in the world if that does happen and, and you know there are lots of schemes that do help with that sort of thing but I think the thing that I kind of realized looking back at the book is that so much of that um, ability to kind of get out of the situation you're in kind of has to come from within it has to be quite a sort of you have to be brave and you have to kind of getting yourself out of your comfort zone is the hardest thing in the world to do because it's your comfort zone. So you want to stay in it and you don't want to have to get out of that. So I think I, even though I knew kind of where the book was going, I still, I think was surprised that there is a bit of a, a nod towards the idea that in the future, Andrew might be 
him and Peggy, the, uh, his kind of uh, counterpoint level, will kind of end up helping people in the future and, and being a bit more community minded. But it still kind of had to come from his own kind of inner strength, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Peggy was a great character. She was like a punch in the gut. She just said it like it was and loved her. Who was the most fun? Uh, what, which character was the most fun for you to write? Because there were some interesting ones in this book, aside from Andrew. I mean, he is, you know, but. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, Peggy was a real joy to write because as you say, she is someone who arrives as a sort of breath of fresh air and is someone who who completely changes things for Andrew because she sort of arrived into his life and is someone who is the polar opposite to him in terms of she is positive and outgoing and she you know, is aware that you know life is short and you've got to make the most of it and I really enjoyed having someone arrive who would show him that mm -hmm. and that just and someone that wasn't just a character to sort of come in and save him she was someone that as much as she wants to help him you know she was is the one that tells him he's got to do things by himself and she's not just going to make everything better for him which was really important to me when I was writing it that I didn't that, you know she, I wanted Peggy to have her own stuff going on as she knows there are problems with her own uh, marriage and she's sort of confronting things as well so she was really fun to write and then I really enjoyed writing uh, Andrew's boss, Cameron, who, who is sort of, I, I'm a huge fan of both the British and American uh, versions of The Office, the TV shows. Uh, I was like, um, yeah, he, Cameron is my David Blunt slash Michael Scott figure. <laughs> he all worked in places where we have a boss who is, who, uh, who is, you know, I've got a, I've got a heart of gold, but is everything they do is the most annoying thing possible. <laughs> and so particularly the fact that he is obsessed with the idea of getting all, all the people who work <laughs> hang out and kind of go for dinner parties and stuff, which is, would be annoying anyway, but Andrew who's trying to preserve this false life. Mm -hmm. The fact that got someone, so, I mean, I, cause I'm such a fan of, of, of TV comedy that you know I'm I'm sure I'm probably a slightly frustrated sitcom writer as well so that was my I'd always look forward to writing those scenes because I would do the sort of heavy lifting with the kind of the emotional stuff or the uh, you know the sort of tricky bits of plotting and then I think oh I've got a fun scene to write now with a dinner party where everything is going to go absolutely terribly so I enjoyed writing those bits. And Keith and Meredith also, this, their whole dynamic reminded me so much of The Office. We said that too, it was great. And it was a little reminiscent of some, um, you know, Nick Hornby's novels also that I was always a big fan of his too. And that, that camaraderie from people who don't normally, you would never put together somehow end up together. So, um, and we touched a little bit upon, you know, about this before, the fact that the book has two titles. So you've published this book and do you want to tell us a little bit how that happened and why and your thoughts on it absolutely yeah so the, I always uh, when I was writing the book the title changed a few times throughout from what I remember but the one that stuck where I had that kind of light bulb moment where I thought oh, I'm going to save this document as this now as opposed to untitled <laughs> or published or whatever it was at the time uh, was how not to die alone because I, it just I, I can't remember where the phrase came from but it, it really made me laugh and it just stuck out to me as something that was clearly quite uh, darkly comic um, but and sort of and intriguing and so that was the title that was that was submitted by my by my agent when it went out on submission in the UK and in the US and the UK publisher thought that in the in a meeting with them to when you know things were when we were negotiating all that and all the kind of that kind of crazy the crazy day I had where the offers were coming in and everything and that was one of the things where they just thought it was a real deal breaker that it just wasn't the, the target audience for the book and sadly to say it's quite it's all very business 
oriented, but there was a real sort of discussion about, which I can totally see where if the book is supposed to be a, uh, you know, from a marketing point of view, it is very much pushed as a uplifting, warm book. And I think they just thought the title was a little bit too spiky and dark. Uh, whereas my publishers in the States were really quite kind of gung ho about it and thought it was, they thought it worked. And, and it, it sort of, it's, it's funny because it, I don't think either one, so say the, so the other title, as it became known, as it was published in the UK, Something to Live For, which then became the paperback cover in the US. And that, again, I'd love to say that was um, something that was slightly different from a business decision, but there was a really big opportunity for um, a store, uh, a chain of, well, I was going to say a chain of bookshops, like you don't know I'm talking about Barnes & Noble, but that's who I'm obviously talking about, where they basically, there was going to, you know, a point of promotion where they would, you know, the book was going to be prominently displayed and they pulled out because they said, it's, this is, 2020 and people are dying you know it's i'm laughing about it now but obviously it's a, been a really terrible yeah. tough time the idea of walking into a bookshop and saying that isn't going to it just won't do so we had to make a really tricky decision and it was it was a really you know it was a hard thing to do because i loved i sort of wanted to stay true to it but i suppose the fact it had changed once already it was really difficult i mean the funny thing is i have had people email me saying oh I bought your book because I thought it was a self-help guide uh but it was called how not to die alone but and like, oh, I'm quite enjoying it and I think <laughs> wow that's even if it's tongue-in-cheek that's quite a, uh, a bold opening gambit to start your self-help <laughs> there we go well also something to live for you know it's, Andrew's uh, a fan of Ella Fitzgerald so he that song comes up quite a bit in uh in the book. So something to live for is an Ella Fitzgerald uh, song. So that um, fits as well. I know I recommended the book and I'm sure my colleagues did as well during the pandemic. And we did have to kind of say, we're not trying to tell you anything <laughs> by handing you this book, but you're going to absolutely love it. It's the best book to read right now. And because um, our copies all have the uh, how not to die alone. Um, mm -hmm title, which I, which I like that darkly uh, funny humor there. Um, anything, did you, did you edit out anything on the characters? I know we always like to ask our authors, like what didn't make it into the book that we might want to know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good question. I, I think the only thing that really massively changed was the the sort of subplot that goes through the novel where uh, Andrew is dealing with a sort of blackmail attempt by his brother-in-law. Uh, that was a lot more, um, that character was a lot more sort of menacing and almost quite uh, like the very obvious villain of the piece. And that was the first thing that both my editor in the in the UK and the States pointed out that the rest of the novel is quite uh, realistic and you know the, the there's obviously you're taking a little bit of a leap with the conceit of the man managing to sort of maintain this lie for so long, but the rest of it feels quite real and the character the character who's blackmailing him the sort of his motivations for doing so changed a little bit more so that they came from a place of anger and grief and he's still a pretty nasty character but he's not in the original draft he was a bit more sort of Machiavellian and and uh sort of almost not particularly saddened about what had happened to his wife it was more about him <clears throat> kind of getting what he getting what he wanted so that was a big thing that's changed it's it's Funny, as I said earlier, that book kind of, it did come to me fully formed and I thought, oh, it's going to be really easy from now on. And the, the second book I wrote, I pretty much, I'd say nothing remained from the, from the first draft. So it's, uh, I was, I was um, 
justly rewarded for my arrogance to thinking that I'd somehow been the first person to crack novel writing. <laughs> Um, one of the things that was like kind of stuck out to me, like I've always, my thing is I always like the, the, I guess the psychology of like how writers pursue and like process their novels and writing. So, um, one of the questions I had was, has the pandemic changed your approach to writing and has it taught you anything new as a writer? I think it. <laughs> I was thinking about this earlier, actually, about whether, um, because I still am working, uh, I've changed my day job a little bit, but I still work part-time in publishing. Uh, so I still get to see all the novels that are, I work on the nonfiction side of things, but I still get to see all the novels that are being submitted. And as of yet, no one has been writing or a sort of pandemic centered, obviously they have have been books about pandemics but no one's written say just a, a romantic comedy where it happens to be set during the pandemic and I think it, that in terms of thinking about whether to feature that or, or whether that has sort of affected that I don't think it has yet because I don't think really that we particularly understand we're all sort of, we're in the middle of it Right. Yeah. So I guess we just I think in five years time, when fingers crossed, hopefully everything's a little bit back, you know, more normal. I think there will be a kind of we will be sort of looking back retrospectively and seeing, you know, what kind of how it's how it affected us at the time and and how we are now. I think in terms of the actual my kind of writing uh how I've sort of changed my kind of writing routine or whatever, I mean I really miss writing in cafes and pubs and public places. I would always try and mix up a little bit where there's nothing quite like being sitting in a, in a cafe surrounded by people and overhearing something or just seeing the way people are interacting. Like I'm a really um, a kind of slightly creepy stalkerish uh, people watcher whenever I'm you know I can't I'm just so obsessed with the way that people react and the mm -hmm. things people say to each other that those sorts of things always would um, end up not necessarily directly quoting something that ends in a book but just sort of I would need that kind of little kickstart to get kind of my imagination working or or so I've kind of really missed the the the, the fact of not being able to be around people more and I've it it's I was lucky that when it came to writing my new book, I um, had written the first draft of it during normal times. And then when it came to edit it, mm -hmm. it was during the pandemic. And that at least meant that I was still, I was working off what I'd already kind of created. I think if I was having to, it is, it is tricky that thing. I think we've all had it where you'll be watching a TV show from a years ago and everyone's standing in a line or, you know, que queuing by for a, by the bar or something and you're thinking no no, no social distancing what are you doing where you're moving? <laughs> so i think it it's it's certainly it's hampered me a little bit in the way that i would normally want to be kind of out writing in public places more and yeah we'll, we'll see what happens when things go back to normal about whether i'll be able to kind of recapture that or not and has um something to live for change or i don't want to say change because that sounds like a big shift or has it made you thoughtful about your outlook on life or just yeah like how has it adjusted your outlook for life finishing this novel for you well I think in terms of um uh the sort of the the central theme or the sort of message of the book where which kind of was about this man finding this, this sort of strength to to have a to kind of try again at life almost and and to um not just sit in his comfort zone i think writing that as a sort of um as having you know a, a central message it then it was kind of very easy for me to sort of do that and then you know uh send that off to to find an agent and then find a publisher and then it turns out when a book gets published, you have to talk about it and you have to <laughs> completely get out of your comfort zone and don't and not turn opportunities down when they come your way because 
it's not something you're used to doing. And I think I really had to sort of put my money where my mouth was in terms of um, really uh, doing things that I would never have done before and being, you know, I, I'm talking in public is one of the things I've hated so much throughout my life. And I was lucky enough that for the publication of the book, I got to go to around the UK, around the States. And it was kind of, I'd never been out of the country on my own. I'd never flown on my own. It was kind of, it would sound sort of ridiculous now because I think I would, that doesn't faze me in the slightest now thinking about it, but it really, really did change a huge amount in terms of me putting my money where my mouth is, as I say, to kind of follow through almost. I suppose in a way, it was like I'd written a letter to myself, right, to the book that I hadn't really thought about. And it was kind of taking the lessons from that and, uh, and, and yeah, and just sort of pushing myself a little bit more um, and yeah, taking opportunities when they, when they came up. So <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's, it's changed a lot of things in that one. I'm kind of, I'm glad it has. And I think, yeah, I don't quite know what would have happened if the book hadn't been published, whether I still would have mm -hmm. learned those things or not. I like to think I would, but yeah, who knows? True. Um, so we're getting close to um, our questions. I know we're going to have, so if you guys have any questions, please put it in the chat. I know, I believe there's two in there so far, but um, you know, we're, we are librarians and we love giving out our book recommendations. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite underappreciated novel? Oh, well, that's such a good question. My favorite fiction and or nonfiction. So you can be, it can be either. Yes. Well, so I'm a massive fan of uh, David Nichols, the writer who wrote One Day is his sort of biggest it, which was made into a film a few years ago mm -hmm. with Anne Hathaway and someone else who I can never remember who they are. Um, and I mean, with he is, I mean, he's probably my favourite writer of all time, and he is massively successful. But I, but I think that the book he wrote called Us, uh, which came out in 2017, 2017 10 years ago ish. Um, is to me the best book ever. It's sort of, I can't quite understand how that's not everyone's favorite book in that way. And you'll, you'll see if you were to read it, it's very much in my wheelhouse and it features a slightly um, hapless uh, middle-aged man going about his uh, life and getting a lot of things wrong in a very sort of uh, funny and uh, kind of heartfelt way. But it, to me, it's a book that, uh, I feel like the best books are the ones where when you're reading a novel where you feel like absolutely everything that you're reading has happened and it just so happens that you're the one person who's found that book and you're reading you're just reading it and you're the only person who it's been written for and that to me when I read that book was probably a moment where uh, I, I think I had slightly fallen out of love with reading after doing my university course where I'd just been reading the classics and was just sort of slightly sick of them and that was a novel where although it's written in an incredibly accessible uh, style, to me, it just it blew me away as to what the power of a novel like that, you know, what power it has. And, and it just, there was a TV adaptation of it recently on the BBC, which I don't know if you guys can find that, but oh, it was just, just as good. So Us by David Nichols is my, but yeah, it's probably. Um. And then what, are you reading anything now? Do you have anything on your to-be-read list that can be shared? What are you reading? What am I reading now? Oh, I just read, um, what did I read? Uh, oh, I read uh, Such a Fun Age uh, by Carly Reed, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, and then I just finished a book by a writer called Max Porter, whose first novel, he's a British writer. His first book came out about four or five years ago called uh, uh, Grief is the Thing with Feathers, which is a slightly, and I don't be too put off by this, but a slightly experimental uh, literary novel. But I promise you, it's very kind of accessible and it's a kind of incredible study of grief um 
but in a slightly kind of unusual way. And his second book, which came out uh, last year or the year before called Lanny, L-A-N-N-Y, about, which was similarly slightly unusual um, story. I'm, I'm realizing as I'm saying it now, I'm being such a giving, it's such a useless pitch for this book, but that's kind of the point of it in that okay. story about a family slightly falling apart and a child who goes missing. But one of the main characters in the book is the landscape as in the literal sort of uh, personified of the character that's called something like Mr. Grumpy Notwood, who is the actual, uh, who sort of is the village and the countryside and everything, who is this omniscient narrator who sort of talks about what's happening. So it's by turns a sort of, it's nature writing, it's a kind of slightly uh, noir-esque uh, thriller about a sort of going missing. So the plot moves at a million miles an hour, but it's very sort of contemplative and as I say, that's a really terrible pitch for it, but it's a, it's uh, and that is that's 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 interesting. And that was called um, "Grief is a Thing with Feathers." That's the first book, and then his new book, which is this one I've just described, is called Lanny, and Lanny. Uh, the author is Max Porter. Yeah, I'd be like, hmm, look out for that one. Um, <laughs> well, I think that's all the questions we have for right now. But um, Okaria, do we have any questions in the chat? Yes, we do. So, all right. First is, what is the best piece of writing advice you received that you still use? Great question. And it, I'm so pleased you asked because it is, if I ever get my own kind of office study to write in, I will pin this on the wall. But, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase this quite badly, but there is an Irish writer called Kevin Barry, brilliant novelist. And so this is paraphrasing his advice, but it's the one thing that I always come back to, which is that, um, and it's essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of twist on the, everyone has a novel in them uh, cliche, which is essentially that the hardest part of writing is the sitting down and writing. And he says that there are so many people there who have probably got absolutely brilliant novels in their brains which are just waiting to escape but the ones who who the books that appear are written by authors who and he describes it as even if you'd rather just pluck your eyes out and feed them to the birds and sit down at your desk and write a book and write you know write that day mm -hmm. it's the one to just sit down and just do it and kind of you know it's just the most painful thing and we're just churning out and he uses a lot more swear words than I'm using in the way he describes this <laughs> It's and it's kind of true in that I, I'd love to, love to say that every day when you write it, it's a sort of it's a joy and it's it's really fun and, and it's as enjoyable as as you know uh, as as reading a, a great book, but it really isn't. And I think it, it sort of and in fact the days where I thought oh I really enjoyed that day writing, it tends to be I come back to it and it's really bad stuff that needs to get cut because. I've usually gone, oh, I cannot bear to have to write that really complicated scene. So, oh no, my characters are now going on this funny little adventure that I can write. And it tends to be something that's a bit more kind of uh, lighthearted or, or fun. So I think to distill that really, it's just sitting down and writing. And even if it feels like you're doing something that's terrible, it's just getting through it and you will feel better the next day for having done that. It's like exercise where it's just, you're running, you think this is just absolutely the best. As I struggled around my block earlier for about 14 minutes and then, but afterwards, you know, you feel that sense of satisfaction and it's only from just sitting down and writing and writing and writing. And by the, you know, when you got to the end of it, you've got that, you know, if it is a novel or, or whatever it is, or a short story, you've kind of got, you've got the words down there and then that's the hardest part. And then it's um, kind of, a, that's when the fun part begins, but you just gotta, you got to sit down and write and that's the only thing you can do. Right. We've spoken to a lot of authors who have committed to writing a certain number of pages a day because they can sometimes get into those roadblocks. So it's almost like, well, I have to write this many pages today and I can't walk away until I do so. But I understand that writing the difficult scenes must be really hard, you know, because how do you pump yourself up for those? And there were a lot of difficult parts in this book. 
you know, that got really deep. So, yeah. Yeah. I think definitely the, um, the word count thing is, is interesting. I definitely, that is something that I do because it, yeah, having that target, I mean, I spent far too much money on this very, uh, fancy pretentious writing software called Scrivener. And the only thing I use it for is that, um, it has a little thing where you can put in a target of words you're supposed to write that day. And then it kind of, you know, the, the and sets a deadline. And that day when you finish, if you've written your a thousand words or whatever it is, a little noise goes doodaloo. And it's like, I can cheer at that point and have a glass of wine and it's the day's over. So yeah, especially the pandemic, you need as much <laughs> support as possible. So it's like, you hear that noise and it's like, oh, someone's complimenting me. <laughs> Someone's saying all right. Oh, so the next question is, when will your next book come out and what will it be about? So it is out uh, in the States on, I believe, July the 20th this year. And it is called When We Were Young. And it is the story of uh, two friends who uh, fell out of touch when they were 15 after a dramatic incident, which kind of split their lives on different paths. And they are, they are reconvening at the age of 30 because when they were 15, uh, before they had this big falling out, they promised themselves that they were going to walk the Thames path, which is a national trail in England, which starts at this tiny little jumble of rocks in the middle of a field in Gloucestershire, which is where the River Thames springs from. And you can walk that journey all the way from sort of the middle of the country, all the way down through Gloucestershire, through Oxfordshire, uh, down towards London, into the city of London, where the path ends at what's called the Thames Barrier. And uh, it's a walk that I did myself a few years ago, uh, where I kind of first had the idea for the book. And yeah, so the um, it's these two characters, Theo and Joel, who uh, have come together to honour this promise they'd made uh, and kind of walk the path together, even though they fell out in a fairly major way. And it was kind of about, um, sort of sprung from the idea of uh, when I turned uh, 30 and having that sort of, um, that first time in your life where you sort of can look back with some sense of objectivity about kind of a period in your life and kind of what happened. And it was the first time I could look back at when I was a stupid, idiotic teenager playing in terrible bands in the countryside and drinking cider and, those kind of long, endless summer, uh, all the friendships I had then and the things that sort of, um, uh, the kind of different paths that our lives take from that point on and how we never really think about it and the sort of nostalgia that comes from that. Uh, and so, yeah, that's out in July. Nice. Something to look forward to. That sounds yeah. like my kind of book. Yeah, even the name is catchy right away too. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So is there any talk of turning How Not to Die Alone into a film? Oh, I love that. Yeah, um, that would be a good reply. So, well, I mean, yes, in the way that uh, there was a, a, yeah, a TV film option uh, taken up by a production company. And so it's one of these things which I think, you know, Fingers crossed one day something will appear. Um, uh, it's one of those things that sort of, yeah, I don't even like to think about because the idea of it happening is too exciting. So I just, uh, <laughs> in fact, it's every time I have a kind of an update about it, it is every single time as well. Things are really tricky at the moment and there's X, Y, and Z. So I'm just kind of delighted at the idea that, um, that it may appear one day, but without getting my hopes up. But it is one of my favorite things to do is to uh, be mentally casting different actors as uh, who play Andrew and who would play Peggy. So as long as I keep getting to do that, then that's, uh, that's kind of the <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. That leads us to our last question. If you could choose any actor to play in. <laughs> oh, well, that's perfect. So, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've skipped around a little bit, but the, the person I've, who's kind of come to the forefront is Martin Freeman, who really? is in... Really? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, not, not he. But don't you think he's got the same slightly... Well, I know him mainly from the UK office as, as the slightly kind of uh, lovable, hapless underdog. And I think he's he's got that slightly... I think as well when he plays uh, uh, Dr. Watson in the Sherlock thing, I think he's got yeah. that slightly... Um, he does the sad bits really well, I think. I would love <laughs> to do the sort of slightly, um, yeah, do the humor and the, and the sad. And the quirkiness, yeah. Yeah, the quirkiness, yeah, definitely. Totally. Simon Pegg is the other person, I think, in that same sort of funny, mm -hmm. funny but can do serious as well. So it would just be, I yeah, I, like I said, I get far too excited even thinking about it. <laughs> it's good to dream, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay. Oh, oh. Do we have time to do our lightning round? It's only a minute. It's three fifty nine. Oh, and someone uh, just wrote they think Freddie Highmore could be an excellent Andrew. So just throwing no. out another suggestion okay. for you to think about. Yes, I, like I think we should try the lightning round. Let's do it. Ooh, I was just looking. I was like, I can't. I'm terrible with people's names, but then when I see, I'm like, yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> the guy from The Good Doctor. Yeah, he would be a good one. Yeah, because that's who Freddie Highmore is. I had to Google it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, so we have one minute left, and um, I will do the timer. Bree, if you can ask uh, Richard the questions. Sure. And you have a minute to answer um, all of the questions. So whatever comes to your mind first. OK. All right? Richard, yeah. you ready? Yeah, hit me. Okay. All right, let's go. So I'm gonna go to Nadine. <laughs> You're on. Ah, which character from your novel would you like to have a drink with at the pub? Oh, Peggy. Ooh, <laughs> okay, okay, nice. Um, what movie would you like to adapt into a novel or series that you would write? Uh, uh, um, uh, the Understudy by David Nichols. Okay, okay. <laughs> Oh. Looking that up, I was like, we're gonna move on. What shows have you been binging on? Oh, uh, The Office again, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, Normal People, mm -hmm. um, what else? Um, oh, Bridgerton, obviously. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it so far. Uh, oh, and, but my next one is gonna be uh, Queen's Gambit, which I haven't watched, but that's next up. Ooh, Nadine, Nadine's a fan of that one. Um, what hobby would you pick up instead of model trains? Um, oh God, this is so nerdy, but uh, I always used to, as a kid, do airfix models like, of planes, like World War II planes. That's kind of like, God, that's so nerdy, but that is genuinely what it would be. Time. Dang it. I was like, we have another one. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we ended on the one that makes me look like a total loser. That's, that's <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all it's good. All good. All right. Well, I want to say thank you again, Richard, for being here, for talking with us today. I think we can all say that, you know, um, we, we truly enjoyed this afternoon. It was wonderful. And you taking the time out to speak with us. And we're really looking forward to your next novel. I think I already ordered the book, actually. So um, <laughs> we're, we're very excited for that. And, um, you know, we wish you well. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming on this afternoon. This was really awesome. Yes. Oh, so thanks nice so to much. meet you, Richard. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been so much fun. I think I... To, to someone when we were setting this up, my uh, my mum was a librarian, and uh, I spent so uh, many kind of younger years in the library, and it was just such a treat to uh, to be in that it's such a special place. So I'm you uh, you guys are doing uh, doing the good work, and uh, yeah, and I hope that uh, everything kind of starts looking better for everyone in pandemic wise soon. And uh, but yeah, thank you for having me. This has been really fun. Oh, thank well. you. It was such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Yes. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. I didn't want to turn you guys just off, so I'm going <laughs> because I'm host, so I'm going to end you guys. Okay. Oh, I didn't end the recording.